Mining community, welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the Mining Podcast. And today's guest is Tim Foden, who's the partner at Boyce Schiller Flexner, the global disputes law firm, who are internationally recognised and known for their creative, aggressive and efficient pursuit of success for their clients. Um, Tim is a dual, dual qualified English US lawyer and specialises in the international arbitration in the mining sector and has acted for both the world's largest mining companies and a host of junior mining companies. And he's here today to talk about disputes in the, obviously in the, in the industry um, and maybe provide some valuable advice if you're faced with any disputes that you uh, may come across. So that's welcome Tim to the podcast. How are you doing Tim? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Rob. No, and I appreciate your time as well. So, as we always uh, kick off these podcasts, just wondering if you can give us a um, overview of yourself, your background, and your career, um, and obviously talk a little bit, talk about a little bit about the mining industry and what what you do within the mining industry. Um, and then I've got a handful of questions to uh, to ask you, and hopefully our audience will gain some knowledge around disputes that they may have had or or may have not experienced or may be in the future. Yeah, look, I'm happy to do that. So uh, I'm a, as, as you can tell from my accent, uh, I'm from the United States. I grew up in Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania, did most of my education in Washington, D.C., and uh, started my life as a disputes lawyer in Washington. Um, while I was there, I did one sort of mining case, and that's the Khan Resources case against Mongolia, uh, before moving to London, because, if, you know, I learned after some time that, that if you want to be in international disputes, and particularly international arbitration, which is my specialty, that London really is sort of the epicenter for that kind of work. And uh, while I was here, I, I did a varying number of disputes. I did cases against Spain in relation to... Uh, changes it made to its solar uh, power generation framework. But then uh, in about 2013, I started to work almost exclusively in mining disputes and um, found that I really, really enjoyed it for reasons that maybe I'll come to later. And uh, over time, it's become you know more ingrained as a specialty. And I, I really enjoy working in the mining industry. I enjoy the personalities. Um, I enjoy the, the, the sites and the, the places that you get to go. And uh, mostly I, I enjoy representing mining companies as clients because I think that they are obviously integral to our future and particularly a clean energy future and that they need to be uh, protected. But also I think they get a bit of a bad rap and um, I like to sort of stick up for, for people. And I particularly like going after bullies and you find a lot, particularly in the junior mining space, that they can be bullied around a lot. So um, I like to punch a bully in the face. Yeah. Um, so why don't you just give us an overview of the company, um, Boy Schiller and Flexner, just, you can just tell us a little bit about Perfect. the company. So I'm pretty new to the company. I'm pretty new to, to Boy Schiller uh, Flexner, which is, um, we call it BSF typically. Uh, BSF is uh, a disputes only law firm. We can't help you with your contract. We won't draw up uh, a JV agreement. I like to say that we, we, we only handle the divorce, not the marriage. And we have offices all around the United States, an office in Italy, and the first international office was this office here in London. And um, I joined, like I said, two months ago. Um, and my job is to uh, help elevate the firm's international arbitration practice. Um, and that's something that I've set to task in doing. The firm was founded in 1997. So it's a pretty young law firm and it was founded by uh, David Boys and Jonathan Schiller. Jonathan Schiller is, is now quite closely, but David Boys is arguably America's most famous lawyer. Um, he has some of the most uh, important cases under his belt, the antitrust case against Bill Gates and Microsoft. Uh, he recently won a massive settlement against Prince Andrew in relation to the Epstein affair. And he, with a, a gentleman named Ted Olson, effectively struck down the uh, amendment in California that made illegal gay marriage. So 
you know, the opportunity to come work at his law firm was one that I really couldn't pass up. Yeah. So what attracted, obviously you mentioned that you started working in uh, the mining industry in 2013. How did you, I mean, I suppose, how did you begin to uh, attract uh, or how did you attract yourself to the mining industry? And I suppose, how does it differ from some of the other industries that you would have worked in and obviously the company uh, specialised in? Yeah, so um, lawyers tend to, to pick, you know, I'm going to do this kind of work. It happens to them. And you're, when you're an associate, as I was then, you just sort of get handed something. And in this particular instance, I was handed, it was my second mining case, but I was handed a dispute that was actually a fraud claim against a mine shaft sinking company in relation to a project that, let's just say it didn't go well in, in Russia. And uh, the client needed help big time. And we were brought in and it related to whether they could sink a mine shaft through incredibly difficult hydrological and geological conditions. And they had effectively said they could. And as it turned out, they had a hard time doing so. And in fact, no one has been able to really do it as so far as I'm aware the last time I checked. And they got sued by their client uh, for fraud. And I was brought in along with a team of others to try and get them out of the jam. Uh, it was a massive claim and I had to learn more than I ever thought I would about, you know, hydrology, geotechnics, the usage of grout, tubbing. Um, and I loved it. I just thought it was so interesting and, and how it distinguishes itself from other disputes like you ask Rob is that you know a lot of lawyers are dealing with disputes about say financial products things that are just you know on a piece of paper not this I mean this is you're looking at something corporeal and um, you know you can be shown how it works and you can go down into this mine sh shaft and I just really really enjoyed that and you know you being a lawyer is in many ways like being a perpetual student when you're a disputes lawyer. You're always having to learn new industries. And here's one that I learned and I thought, oh, I kind of like this, I fancy it. But most importantly, I enjoy the people. You know, mining companies are full of incredibly intelligent, highly educated, credentialed people. But yet at the end of the day, they're still digging in the dirt. They've got you know dirt under their fingernails. And I grew up in a relatively working class environment. I spent my summers digging ditches for my brother's plumbing company. And so there's something highly relatable about the people who work in that field. And you know, there's even, I always find that there's two sort of kinds of mining company CEOs. You've got the, the geo, geologists and you got the investment bankers. And the investment bankers are a totally different kettle of fish, but I love them too, because you know they know exactly what they want and they're usually just all, they're guys who probably could have been lawyers and ladies who could have been lawyers. And so they get it right away. You start explaining to them what you need to do and they're so sophisticated that they're all over it. I mean, I have a particular client named Bronwyn Barnes uh, out of Indiana Resources. And I don't have to tell Bronwyn anything. She understands everything as soon as I tell her. So, you know, it, it's just a real pleasure to work with people in that space. And that's why I continue to do it. And that's why I spend a lot of time in Toronto and in Perth and in Vancouver and you know, even Johannesburg is because these, these are the people that I enjoy working with. So what would you say is the nature of the sort of typical dispute that you, uh, that you handle within the industry? Yeah. So Rob, I think, you know, I handle two kinds of disputes, really. You've got, corporate dispute, you know, sort of commercial dispute between, say, two joint venture partners or a dispute over the meaning of a drilling contract, which is one I did in Tanzania about did this contract guarantee a minimum number of meters be drilled per year such that it would be, you know, profitable for our opponent, things like that. I do, you know, I did a dispute recently over a roaster for antimony, uh, and, excuse me, antimony um, and, you know, whether whether the cash calls could be met, should be met, things like that. But what really keeps me busy, and this is all public information, is I handle companies' claims against sovereign states uh, for interference in their investment, whether that's the expropriation of a license or the failure to protect a mine site from uh, 
locals who frankly are wielding guns and want to take it for themselves. You know, the situation, for instance, at Las Bombas in Peru, that that is sort of a microcosm in many ways of, of the kind of work that I do. And uh, right now I'm, I'm incredibly busy, uh, again, all public record, but I'm doing two cases against Poland for the expropriation of some coke and coal assets, two cases against Tanzania in respect of a gold and um, nickel mine, uh, two, two different mines, a uh, case against Peru in respect of a gold mine, and a case involving uh, the Dominican Republic, which is actually a commercial case. It's about uh, the breach of, of a contract that my client had entered into with the Dominican Republic. So uh, very busy, but usually cases against states. That's sort of been the, my forte. Yeah, and uh, so with the disputes that you get involved in, are they generally company versus company, or could it be against, obviously, governments, councils, etc.? Yeah, look, I do a lot of company versus company, but I mainly do cases against countries. And just so that the, the listener is aware, uh, there is a network of treaties around the world that protect investments from country A in country B and vice versa. And if you are a mining company from country A and you've invested in country B and that treaty is in place, you're protected as a foreign investor. And should country B do something that harms your investment, you have the ability under that treaty to take them to international arbitration. Now, notably, and I'll, I'll probably come to this later, but if you if you're not, if you're country A and country B and you don't have a treaty in place, you can always set up a holding structure that enables you to gain access to a treaty by setting up a hold co in a country that does. And so that's in large part what we do. Uh, my former law firm did a lot of representation of the states in those disputes. I did not. Um, my, my sort of groove these days is representing mining, mining companies, particularly junior companies. Any sort of memorable moments um, from your time in mining disputes? Any, any that are out that you felt, um, I suppose, that were very memorable and obviously, obviously resulted in uh, your favor or the company's favor that you represent him? Yeah, so um, there are a lot. I mean, I think mining in particular is, a, is an industry full of adventure. Um, you know, just about any time I'm cross-examining someone, uh, that is an incredibly meaningful experience for me. Obviously, I can't go into the details of those cross examinations, but you know, there's there's a lot to be said about someone who puts in a witness statement, you know, a bunch of lies, and then getting the opportunity to expose those lies and and make your client feel vindicated. That's always good. But you know, some of the biggest memories I have are you know being in a van in a uh, former Soviet Union country where our opposing council, we were doing a site visit and our opposing council told us not once, but twice that they couldn't guarantee our safety. And we were like, what, what does that mean? Why do you keep saying that? It's very strange. And sure enough, a couple of weeks later, we're driving out to the site in an old van, no safety belt, thing starts to canter onto its side, runs into a gully in the snow, we're mowing over trees left, right, and center. We don't flip, I don't know how, but we stay upright, hit the last tree, and see at the corner of our eye, the front left wheel of the van just go rolling by us. And eventually, myself and the other experts and the other lawyer who was in the van had to go find the brake pad, bring it into the cabin or the disc brake because it was so hot it would keep us warm while we were waiting for people to come pick us up. There was also a time um, where I was in a sub-Saharan African country and the government made very clear that they didn't want me around. Um, that was quite the adventure. Uh, you know, I didn't sleep particularly well that night, but you know, a lot of what our job is, and you know, lawyers always get a bad rap, but sometimes our job is to speak truth to power. And when our clients get messed about, you sometimes have to say to the your opposing side, you know, you don't get to treat them this way. And a lot of government officials aren't 
used to getting spoken to that way. So, you know, it, it can create some hairy moments at times. What's the strangest sort of dispute that you've been involved in where you probably thought, I'm not sure why, why this, why this dispute is happening because it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't seem why it should be a dispute from mm. obviously from one party. What, so what's, what's the sort of strangest situation you've been in? Well, there was one uh, you know, that was quite funny. It was about a diamond mine in Angola. Um, and I was brought in to represent uh, the joint venture partner, the local joint venture partner who was, you know, didn't have any money. Joint venture had gone bust and they had entered into an agreement whereby they'd get sort of all the assets back and they just had to provide reporting to their joint venture partner about what what they were doing every quarter. And they did that, but you know, the, the, the mine never turned profitable again. And the joint venture partner sued. And it's like you couldn't understand why they're, you know, they're suing, they're, you can't get blood from a stone. And it was the first case I ever did where it was just me as an advocate. I didn't have really, I had one associate backing me up, but I was the sort of lead advocate in the case. And uh, our opponents were just dead wrong. Couldn't understand why they were bringing this case, which came down to the interpretation of one word in a contract. Um, and we had the right interpretation, and I think you could see that. But also, they didn't have any money. So what was the point? And we beat the other side handily. We got they 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 got one claim they won for failure to provide financial records in a certain format, and they were awarded ten U.S. dollars in damages uh, because it was nominal damages situation. I think we paid it change, um, but. Everything else we won, including all of our costs. The, our opponent had to pay our costs. And I still, you know, I, I was quite proud of the performance I gave and that we got this complete victory. And then I realized one day, you know what? Their accountants probably told them that they had to like sort of finish out that particular liability in order to close their books. And that was the only reason they were bringing the case. So, you know, it's one of those moments where you think that you're terrific and then you realize, well, you're probably always going to win that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what do sort of mining companies need to know to protect themselves when um, especially investing in, in a risky jurisdiction? You know, they need to talk to a lawyer. I mean, I cannot, I cannot stress this enough. And I'll say this too, Rob, it's not just risky jurisdictions that you need to be uh, wary of. In a day of, of ESG, and uh, countries becoming increasingly concerned about what a mine might do for the country, including develop, developing countries, sorry, developed countries, can be just as um, aggressive towards mining companies as the developing co countries. But what they really need to do is they need to ensure that they've got some form of legal protections in place before they make the investment. And you would be shocked at how few miners actually go through the exercise of saying, okay, we're investing in country A. Does our country have a treaty in place with that country to ensure that if something goes wrong, we have the ability to vindicate our rights. We can go to the World Bank. Uh, there's a place called the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes and bring an arbitration claim. And you know, they, they almost never check that structure. And they never check that structure in circumstances where they're investing in a country that they think is low risk, even though those countries, well, can be quite high risk when it comes to mining. What they always do is check to make sure that they're, they're tax optimized, right? But optimizing your taxes is only good if you're pulling ore out of the ground and making profits. What you need to first do is ensure that when you're conducting exploration, you have sufficient protections in place. And what those protections are, they come in a treaty. And what, what happens is when, when something does go wrong, you have that right to fall back on. So I frequently meet with mining companies and they'll say, ah, I've run into trouble in country. Said, okay, let me take a look at what the holding structure is. And you find out that they've invested in that country directly with no intermediate vehicles and there's no treaty in place. And I am in the unenviable position of saying, well, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to go to the local courts. And that typically doesn't fly, even in developed countries, because you're never going to win a, a massive case against, for instance, Sweden 
in the local courts and it might take you 12 years if it does. But if you have a treaty in place, you can bring a claim at the World Bank. It'll take you a few years, but those awards that are produced, they're enforceable. Governments tend to pay them. That's what I always get asked. Oh, the governments actually always pay? Yeah, they do pay. And if they don't, you can take that award to 160 countries around the world and attach assets of that country abroad. And then they do really start to pay if they haven't up until that point. So the only major exception to this rule of they need to ensure that treaty structuring is in place is if they've got a direct agreement with the state that provides a right to arbitrate outside of the country. And you do find those, you know, you, you, you undertake a project like Simindu, you're gonna make sure that you've got protections in place, right? But it's the juniors that never look at that stuff. And one of the services that I've offered for years now, and I do it for free, uh, up until a point, of course, is I'll write you a memo. I go around to Perth and I say, oh, you're thinking about investing in, in Sudan? Great, let's make sure you're protected if things go poorly. Um, and, you know, I haven't gotten to a point yet where one of those memos has come back to me and they said, actually, we do need to do a case. But it's a lot better to me than having that gut punch moment that I've had with so many mining companies where we, we look at their claim and we start to analyze whether they've got any protections in place and they don't. So, you know, if you're watching this and you're thinking about going into a place, give me a ring because we will provide you with some advice to ensure that you've got that protection in place. And it can be so simple, just setting up a simple holding company in the structure in a country you know, like Singapore, like Mauritius, like the Netherlands that have this vast network of treaties. It is the best backstop you can have. What do you say is a common theme amongst mining companies um, where, you, where it tends to turn into a dispute which could easily be resolved um, which obviously could have been easily been avoided. Is there a common thing amongst mining companies that, and maybe you might have just explained that just now, but whether, whether that's a structure um, that you set up going into a company. But is there, is there any other um, themes that you see that are pretty common, which if they've done something initially, obviously got in contact with you initially, all these disputes, which could go on for a, a long period of time, could have been um, avoided. You know, whenever I'm walking around West Perth and I do these coffee meetings, people always sort of tend to say at the end of the coffee, Tim, I hope I never get to see you again. <laughs> because, you know, dispute lawyers are not the person you, you, want to, you want to build a mine. You don't want to build a legal case. But unfortunately, People tend to call me when things have gone wrong. They don't tell me when they're starting to go wrong. But uh, it does happen. And what I try to do is make sure that they're protecting themselves in case that dispute does start to crystallize. Um, you know, I, my job is to deliver outcomes for clients. It's not to win cases. And if the best outcome for my client is that they get to keep mining, and that's what they want, then that's my job to get it. But what I often see is that a company will be start to lead down a sort of primrose path by a country and by the regulator. And, you know, miners believe them. You know, you, I think there's a lot of optimism in mining. You need to be an optimist because most projects don't come off. Um, so when someone tells you, oh, don't, don't, don't worry, we're gonna give you that license back, you tend to believe them. But what I can do is come in and say, right, maybe they will, you never know. But let's make sure we're taking steps to ensure that we don't prejudice any claim if they don't. And what's that mean? Well, first of all, you know, we're talking about ASX, TSX listed companies, these people have to announce everything they do. You know, when they go to the bathroom in the morning, they've got to make an announcement. And the number of times I've seen a client of mine or a prospective client of mine make an announcement, basically saying everything's going to be fine. The government's measures that they've taken are actually not that bad. And then you find yourself a year and a half later and you're doing the dispute and you have to explain away that, you know, our, our client was, wasn't complaining then. So, uh, you know, one of the things we say is like, 
you need to run your, your public statements through us to make sure we're not putting a foot wrong in the future. Um, we can be really good at helping to negotiate with governments. Um, we don't just punch first, although I know some government officials who might tend to disagree with that characterization. What we can do is say, we've been down this road before, sometimes with that specific government. These are the people you need to be speaking to. These are the things you need to say. Or alternatively, we can say, this isn't happening. You're, you might not realize it now, but you are headed towards the path of arbitration and there's very little you can do about it. And why would that be the case? Well, because we're living in an era of resource nationalism. And so sometimes the decisions that the governments take are dictated by the electorate. If you whipped up a fury in your home country in order to get elected about these evil mining companies taking national resources away, then you're beholden to that path. It's very difficult for you as a politician to all of a sudden turn around and say, yeah, actually they're not that bad and we're gonna work with them. So sometimes a train is set in motion and our job is there to make sure that you're protecting yourself, you don't say anything against your own interests, but also to sit there and have what we love to say in the US is to sort of come to Jesus moment, that this is the time. And um, that's, you know, that, that's, a, that's a lot of what I do. You know, a lot of the people I meet with labor under the impression that everything is gonna get better. And I have to sit there and be like, it might, it might not, but we're here. Yeah. What are some of the first signs that you see a company experiencing as they are, and they may not even necessarily be aware of it, that probably will end up in a dispute? Is there particular signs that um, you could, I suppose, give our audience um, that they may be experiencing and not realising that that's probably the route that they potentially will be going down? Um, through your obviously experience? Yeah, I think uh, when you look at some of the coups that have happened in West Africa, you know, those coups will take place. And, you know, it's a sort of like the who said, meet the old, the new boss, same as the old boss. And, and, and the new boss will want to make an impression. So you've got to be careful. They, they will tend to renegotiate deals. Governments with anytime there's a new election, um, you can see activities start to change. I did a case against the state where an upcoming election basically allowed a, um, a politician to, who was trying to win a particular election in a particular state to allow an invasion of illegal miners into the company's mine site. And that was an electoral play. You know, some countries elect, you know, legal miners or artisanal miners can be a really powerful lobby. And so they were trying to curry favor with that vote as it were. So when you see elections coming up, that's when things tend to change. Uh, I think you also see circumstances now, unfortunately, and I referenced Las Bombas earlier where, you know, local communities are taking up arms against against uh, um, companies, sometimes because you know there's a legitimate gripe, although I'd never advocate that violence is ever justified. And sometimes just because they want to mine the mine for themselves, even though you're, you know, our client might have the right to, to, to do so. Like statements, I think you've got to be careful about what you say. You know, like I said, miners are optimists. So when bad measures come, the number of times I've seen press releases saying, actually, it's a good thing for us. Well, that can really come around to bite you in the ass when you've got to go bring a claim. So those are the main things to sort of keep in mind uh, as a situation starts to develop. Um, let's <laughs> say a miner has its uh, license revolt. Um, what should they do next, apart from call yourself? Well, no, I mean, it's true. They should call ourselves. So, uh, what they need to do is, um, again, watch what they're saying to the government. Um, they should recognize that there's gonna be diminishing returns with interacting with the government. There's only so much you can get out of a government in those situations. Um, they shouldn't do something like, well, we're gonna bid for it again, because in doing so, you're sort of acknowledging that it was rightfully taken away from you in the first place. Um, but really it's, is they should call a lawyer. They should call someone like myself or one of my competitors 
you know, prefer not to call my competitors and um, start to talk about what your options are. And uh, this is something that mining companies need to do irrespective of their financial position, okay? Because one of the things that has been a revolutionary step in terms of the junior mining space, and it's something myself and, and really sort of one other practitioner have, have identified, is that junior mining companies often find themselves with really good claims against sovereigns. But, you know, they've been down this road before. Oh, well, tough luck, time to walk away, go on to the next project. You don't have to do that. You know, you as the CEO or the CFO, you can go on to the next project. But there are companies now that will finance your claim for you. If you don't have the money, you can go to one of these third party funders and they will pay my legal fees. They will pay the costs of the tribunal. Obviously they're gonna take a return on any award that is issued, but they enable mining companies to now see potential or contingent value where there previously was none. And you know, I think you get, you get sovereigns that say that this is sort of a vulture-like tactic, it's not. Real value gets put into these mines. And importantly, these third-party funders, they don't, they're not gonna be interested in your case if you drew, you know, if you drilled two boreholes, the whole thing gets taken away from you and all of a sudden you're complaining that you want $2 billion. They won't do that. They wanna see that the company has sunk actual money into the ground and into the process. And if they do that, then they have comfort that they can fund the claim. So that's why if it's been through that process, it's almost like a, another vetting process. And we've been very successful, I've been very successful in recent years at marrying junior mining companies with that third party finance. It could be a pain because you're basically arguing the case to someone before you argue the case, but it can be great outcomes for our clients where all of a sudden they're able to either within the company or at a new company, start pastures new, but knowing that with their participation in a case, which is usually not a sort of day-to-day -day thing, or at least it isn't for much of the case's life, they can ensure that, 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 that some of the value from all the effort gets realized. And I really, you know, I, I think that that's a process by which I'm really proud that we've been able to deliver additional potential value to the mining sector in that regard. Now, miners, interestingly, they don't like doing this stuff, right? They, they want to build a mine. They don't want to build a legal case. But we're getting there. We're starting to, to make them realize that, that in many instances, they don't really have a choice and that a dispute is inevitable. And you can either bring the dispute or you can just go to the next project and leave money, potential money on the table. How has the issue of uh, social license, which is obviously, which is obviously been... Um, it's coming to the industry more and more over the, over the last few years. How's that come up in some of your cases that you've been involved in? Yeah, so social license is an incredibly important issue and it's uh, one that, you know, my clients have all taken really seriously. I, I can say hand on heart that our clients in each one of the instances in which I'm working currently sought to obtain a social license. They did the right things. They spent the money on getting the right consultants. They liaised with the right communities. Um, but that doesn't, stop, uh, that doesn't stop states from trying to put forward a sort of social license defense. And where you really see that defense in these cases spring up is in the issue of causation. Did the state's actions actually cause the damages that you're complaining of in the case? And the argument you see from states very often is now, well, you never would have gotten a social license for this project. So the project wouldn't have gone forward and you wouldn't have ever you know, made the profit that you're now saying you won't. And that is an increasingly common defense. What I'm saddened by is how it can be weaponized in a way where it's not necessarily the case, you know? I, and I can see some of the heartbreak in my clients who have spent months or years of their lives working with local communities, buying, you know, cars and helicopters, or sorry, cars and motorcycles for local police forces and, and working to ensure that there are job programs and, 
building schools and roads and educational facilities for local communities and only to have a state come back and say in the in the arbitration proceeding sorry you didn't do any of those things it's it, it that's the part of a lot of my clients where they feel like they're actually doing something good and to have it thrown in their face that they're not opportunistically can can really hurt so you know i think we have a a balance to strike by ensuring that we are not in any way ever taking sort of social license or ESG issues flippantly. At the same time, it's it's being increasingly weaponized against minors who did have good intentions and did do the right things. And I've seen this before in cir circumstances where, you know, in some jurisdictions, uh, it's not always easy to find out which local is actually in charge of the tenements that you're operating on. And you can have competing claims to that. And the communities will oftentimes sort of compete against each other to try and see who, which one is gonna have the surface infrastructure built on, for instance. And you can do your damnedest to work with all of them. But sometimes maybe even a third one will come out and say, actually, that's our land. And you know, there, despite all the efforts, you can still have a defense thrown against you that, uh, sorry, well, you didn't get this one on board. Well, they tried and the mine isn't actually within their territory, but that doesn't stop a state from trying to take advantage of that situation. I think that is problematic, but it doesn't in any way negate the uh, importance of the social license concept, which I was really hard and I was at Mines and Money right before the pandemic and to hear how seriously all these mining companies at, at a minimum say they are taking those responsibilities was quite heartening. Uh, I've got a couple more questions. Um, what do you see happening in the future as regards to sort of mining disputes? I think we're gonna continue to see a bit of a wave of resource nationalism. Uh, you know, nationalism is fervent across the entire world in my home jurisdiction right now. Um, it is a powerful force and it extends, of course, just to a country's national resources. Um, I think we might have seen the crest of that particular wave as you see some populist governments getting voted out and, and uh, you know, countries sort of backpedaling on some of the statements that politicians had made in runs up to elections about mining companies. Mm -hmm but you still see it. I mean, Mexico is likely to nationalize all of its lithium production. And that trend isn't gonna die anytime soon. One of the things I find interesting about this particular trend is that when I first started doing these kind of disputes, a state might take, you, take something from you, but it's gonna do it via regulation. It's gonna be a death by a thousand cuts. They're never gonna say that they were trying to take the mine from you. That was what countries did back in the 60s. And that's why we have this whole form of dispute resolution because countries would do that. And then more powerful countries would say, you don't mess with our corporate interests. And they'd send in the gunboats. They set up this system to try and prohibit that from happening, to stop that from happening. So in the early days, it was, I'm taking your oil, your oil wells or I'm taking your mine. States got smart. They stopped doing that so overtly but now with resource nationalism, like I said, they're sort of locked in to that path once they get elected. So you are seeing the sort of upswing in these cases that where a state is saying outright, we're taking this away from you because we want it in the hands of say the Mexican people or the Polish people. And you know we don't care and you're foreign and we, it doesn't matter. Um, so that's been new almost to me. And it makes my job, frankly, a lot easier because one of the things these treaties protect against is the right, the ability of a state, can, a state cannot discriminate against the mining company on the sole basis that they're foreign. They can't take their assets away and hand them over to the state-owned mining company. That kind of discrimination is illegal as a matter of international law when the treaty is in place. So we're gonna still see a fair amount of that. I think we're gonna see, like I said, I think we're gonna see a lot more defenses based on the social license concept, which as everyone knows, is quite nebulous and therefore open to usage by a state in that setting. Um, I think we're gonna see, uh, obviously, a real, a real sort of series of, of serious disputes concerning 
battery minerals, right? And it's the hot thing. Everyone wants wants battery minerals. And you got a lot of states that are awakening to that. And they're doing a couple of things. They might like, you know, Mexico nationalize lithium, or they might start creating really crazy demands on countries to, to get their act, or sorry, on companies to develop projects at a rate that is untenable because they know that other companies, particularly some companies from certain Asian countries, will be right there waiting and do it at whatever speed the sovereign says to do it. And so states need, or sorry, companies need to be aware of those possible sort of changes to their development pipeline and their development timelines for assets. And lastly, as a conclusion, just wanted to give us um, your sort of final thoughts. Yeah, look, I think uh, this is a space in which um, I, I enjoy working, I enjoy the mining community, I enjoy how switched on and entrepreneurial everyone is. Um, I think, you know, they're completely adverse to lawyers, which as someone who grew up the son of a house painter, I get it, my dad hated lawyers too, but we're a necessary evil. And I think that my clients would tell you that I'm here, like I said, to provide outcomes, not just to go run up bills on people. Um, and, you know, I think that there shouldn't be an aversion to getting us on board early because we can help a lot better earlier on. Um, and, you know, I think lastly, I just like to thank all of my clients. I, I work with an exceptional group of people. I'd even like to reference their names. I love, you know, thank you, Bronwyn, for all of your help. I've worked with a guy named Ben Stoikovich at Prairie Mining and, and his colleague, Simon Kersey. They've been terrific clients and I've really enjoyed learning so much from them and uh, guiding them through a, a part of the lives that isn't pleasant. You know, disputes are like divorces. Everyone had great um, expectations for the development of a mine and to see those crushed is very difficult. And so there's a part of my job that's, that's acting as counselor. Um, I'm grateful as well to uh, my, my, my client Gordon in Vancouver, who's at Lepaka Gold, and uh, my, my client Brian Johnson and James Tears at Enviro Gold, who built an incredible project in the Dominican Republic that helped remediate the environment. And it's my pleasure to act on their behalf. Um, and of course, you know, I have clients at a company called Windshear, Mark Sander, and uh, Richard Williams, who have been you know, just incredible to work for. And they put a lot of faith in me and, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased to, that they do so and I hope to repay it. So, and I'm, of course, thank you, Rob. I'm, you know, I've been watching the podcast for some time now and listening to it. And you really do glean a lot of insights. Your questions are great and you get, or you don't need to ask Rick Rule too many things to hear some interesting points, but man, was that entertaining. And, uh, you know, you can really learn a lot about the industry from your podcast. I love exploration radio too. It's great, but I'm not a geologist. So this is a little bit more of my speed. Yeah. Tim, really appreciate your time. And yeah, the, the, the podcast is really to educate the mining community in all, in all different disciplines. And for instance, this episode, um, like you said, people don't necessarily need you until they need you. And you're just giving, you're giving content to people to say, look, this is what, this is what we do for companies. And this is what we do for our clients. And you don't need us when you need us. Think about us before, if you're, if you're starting a new project or going into a new jurisdiction, if you're going into something that you don't hundred percent know, reach out to you reach out to you and just get your, your advice. And... We're just part of the due diligence process, Rob. Yeah. That's what we are in those early stages and we are happy to help. Yeah. Um, Tim, if people want to reach out to you, our audience, um, how can they go about doing that? Are you across social media platforms? I am. I'm really just on LinkedIn. I don't do any other social media, but I'm quite active on LinkedIn. So in fact, that's how I got to know Rob. Uh, feel free to contact me that way. My email address is also tfoden at bsfllp.com. Um, and, uh, you know, all my contact details are on LinkedIn. So just drop me a line or you can Google me and um, you'll find my boy Schiller profile. Yeah, sure. And we can put those in the show notes 
a company's podcast anyway. So, Tim, it's really good insight to um, so our audience can understand uh, what you do. Um, and like I said, reach out to Tim before you actually need him, not when you need him. Um, you both, so, as you need if you want, if you want to. Rob, yeah. Thanks so much for having me. No worries, and I appreciate your time. Those that are listening, um, hope you enjoyed that. I'm sure you would have learned a few things uh, from Tim's content and appreciate if you can share this episode amongst others in the industry. Uh, you never know what some mining owners or mining executives are going through. Um, by listening to this podcast, um, hopefully you might be able to solve some of their issues, some of their challenges that they may be facing. Um, and obviously passing this episode on to them uh, may obviously help them in their um, pursuit of their project or operation that they're involved in. So really appreciate you guys listening. Appreciate your continued support. And until next time, happy mining.